started. Rob's going to be in a little bit. We uh, <clears throat> we're kind of comparing notes and figure uh, I had some things that the Lord laid on my heart. He's got some things the Lord laid on his heart. Between the two of us, probably got one whole message. <laughs> so <laughs> we figured that must be what God wants today. But he said, go ahead and get started. So we can go ahead and start. Lord God, ask Lord Jesus that you would <clears throat> add your blessing to the word tonight, Lord God. You would teach us, Lord God. You would lift us up, Lord Jesus. You would help us understand more your ways, Lord God, because when we understand your ways, Lord, the way you do things, then we aren't as surprised in the specifics of what you do because we trust your heart, your mind, and your ways. Lord, I pray that you would just take us deeper into the ways of the Spirit. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's start in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. I've said this many times, Romans chapter 8 is my favorite chapter in the Bible, pretty much. It's like every time I go back there, I, I, there's just such a wealth of information that I just go deeper and deeper into it. But in verse 18 he says, this is uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul speaking, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Now, <clears throat> it's important as we're going through this study, one of the things Ron and I are focusing on right now is the gifts, but also the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? And uh, I'm not saying the two are, in, are inseparable, <clears throat> because they're not. Uh, we, have, we have all seen, <clears throat> possibly me and Ron more than anyone, men that are incredibly gifted who have low character. And that's a very unfortunate thing. It causes a lot of sadness, causes a lot of disruption in the body of Christ. We've also seen, puzzlingly, people that have tremendous character but have very little gifting. Okay? And sometimes your mind kind of <clears throat> kind of goes round and round on that. I remember uh, a very kind of watershed moment for me when uh, I, there was a pastor that I won't mention his name because some of you may know it. Know it. Probably not, but you might, so I don't want to I don't want to cast any particular aspersions. But uh, <clears throat> tremendously powerful, tremendously gifted man up in San Francisco area that would lead us out on the streets witnessing. And uh, I'm not going to go into any specifics. I'll just let you know that it did come out that he very much so had feet of clay. And there were things in his life <clears throat> that if I detailed them to you, you would be shocked and, and abhorred. And uh, would be amazed because I watched this man do great things for God. And I don't mean specific healings and miracles because that wasn't his calling. I watched him go into areas of spiritual warfare that were, that were astounding. Uh, I watched things happen that, 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 that he at times literally shifted the opinion of the entire city uh, of San Francisco to, uh, to, to acceptance of the gospel on a level that we had not seen that would that last literally for years. And, um, <clears throat> but I watched where it, it became so bad that he was actually, he had to actually be asked, request to leave, requested to leave his own church, and, uh, and uh, left the ministry altogether. And I, I was so shocked, and my, and my question in my heart was, Lord, how could you bless a man, how could you so anoint a man with so much sin in his life? And, you know, because we equate holiness with anointing. And I'm going to tell you right here, that's a bad equation. Don't make that equation. God anoints, understand this, God anoints people not due to their holiness, but due to the work he needs done. And God anoints men because that's all he's got. If you find a man with great anointing and great character, great. <laughs> but if you find a man that has great anointing, Low character. God anointed him because there was a work he needed done, and he was and he's trying to find a man. He was trying to find a man that would do that do that work. Yeah. Yes. You know, excuse me, but you know that when that it makes sense to me. But at the same time, I would say, you know, maybe being a new Christian, I would say this guy is working with the side of the enemy because I mean his his life is, is, is simple, and then 
You know, that, 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 is, that is what I struggled with. Yeah, yeah. Let, let, let me tell you what the Lord told me. I, I, at that time, I, I just had to get out of it. I'm just like, I can't take this anymore. This is a man. He literally was my hero. <clears throat> I, I'm like, this is a guy I want to be like, you know, when I grow up. <laughs> I've grown up. I guess I, I, guess I missed that boat. But uh, I went up into the mountains and went on a, on a retreat for a while. And I just said, Lord, I need an answer. And my prayer was, Lord, how could you anoint a man with sin in his life like that? And God spoke to me as clear as a bell, and he said, the same way I anoint you. None of us are ever holy enough to deserve the anointing of God, and thank goodness we aren't. It would not be healthy if we were, number one. Number two, it's just flat impossible. You will never gain the anointing of God by being holy. Okay? That is not where it comes from. The anointing of God comes from, uh, Mario Merlo always used to say, he said, uh, God doesn't anoint, uh, let me see if I can get it right. God does not anoint those who are talented and qualified. He anoints those who are willing and obedient. <laughs> and all I can say is many times when you see the flaws in, in the character of someone who has great anointing and carries a great weight of authority in the body of Christ, you may look at him and so, say, if you want to say this, gee, I wonder who God called first, who <laughs> refused to go and refused to be obedient. Uh, Reinhard Bodke uh, is famous for saying, uh, when he would told God, God, why did you call me? God said, I, you weren't my first choice. <laughs> Just remember, if God gives you a great anointing, that anointing might have been for somebody else who said no. <coughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> And Paul says this, our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. We are being prepared for a future glory, not just to go to heaven. This is not about comfort. Many religions uh, try to uh, present heaven as uh, a place of, you know, strumming harps and, uh, you know, people floating around on clouds. I don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but I can tell you this, heaven is going to be a place of activity Amen. and production. Amen. Things are going to be happening. It's, it's not just a place of being rewarded for being a good person on earth. God is not looking just to reward you because you are good. God is looking for people of character to walk with him in governing a future world. Okay? So it says right here... The, <clears throat> The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, which is God, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. <laughs> now, I don't want to go too deeply into this. Uh, I could probably develop this one subject all night, and I'm not going to. But... Uh, as many of you know, I, I, I taught physics for many years. And one of, the, uh, one of the things we teach in physics is what's called the law of entropy, which can be very simply stated, everything decays. Everything goes from a more, more complex state to a less complex state. And uh, even looking at it, scientists even now are puzzled. It's like, I wonder why that is. The human body, for example. The human body deliberately, at a certain age, begins a process of decay that doesn't need to happen. <clears throat> There's no reason why certain hormones stop, uh, stop being produced at a certain age. There's no reason why <clears throat> certain functions of the body decrease. There's no reason why skin loses its elasticity at a certain level. There's no reason for it. We, we don't, there's no reason why the human body could not live for hundreds or even thousands of years being self-repairing. Honestly, there really isn't. In fact, some, some creatures are capable of living and, uh, <clears throat> and, and being relatively healthy, uh, some trees even, for thousands of years. So <clears throat> we look at it and we realize that God built into this creation a process of decay. And it's a good thing because, let me put it this way, everything we do on this earth except the way we relate to each other in a spiritual realm has no eternal significance. 
if I were to stand up and break this chair, it really isn't going to matter on an eternal, eternal scale, is it? This chair isn't going to exist in heaven anyway. Wood is the, 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 chair, the, the wood in this chair eventually is going to rot and fall apart anyway. There's going to come a day when, you know, <clears throat> even in this church, we're going to say, this chair is getting too old and rickety, let's get rid of it. And this is the way the physical world is. The mountains gradually erode. You know, the, 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 and of course with pollution, we're doing, a, we're doing a pretty good job of adding to it, right? So everything goes through a process of decay that is actually kind of unusual. It's like, we often even wonder, it's like, well, how the world gets so beautiful to begin with as we see it decaying around us? And of course, then we see the hand of God. But there is going to come a day that God is going to take us from the place we're in. And the place we're in is a place where we can afford to make mistakes because we are not dealing with eternally significant objects. I can afford to make a mistake and break a chair. That chair isn't going to last for eternity. I can afford to make a mistake and accidentally burn down my house. That house is going to crumble to dust at some time anyway. So I see that the only things that are significant to me are the things that have eternal value, which is other people, my character. What things are going to go into the next eternity, the, the next world with me, <clears throat> those are the only things of value now. I will tell you this. We talk about gifts and fruits. If you were to ask which is more important, Obviously, I'd say the fruits have more importance because the gifts are all going to disappear. There's going to come a day when all gifts are going to be gone. There will be no, there, nobody, there, will, there will not be any healing evangelists in heaven. Oral Roberts will be there, but he's not going to be holding healing meetings. Any guesses why? Because there's no sickness in heaven. So why hold a healing meeting? I'm not going to need to have a word of knowledge. Uh, you know, I come up here on Sunday and we pray for people and and regularly, people come up to me, and God will give me a word, and I'll give them a word of knowledge, and it'll bless them. A fellow came up Sunday, and I just had a very, very quick word for him. He came up and got saved later on. You know, he was very touched, <clears throat> tears coming to his eyes, <clears throat> and later he, he came up and accepted the Lord. But <clears throat> if he's there with me in eternity future, which I... Totally planned for that brother to be there. He came out and got saved, so we're looking forward to that. All right? But if he is there, I will not give him a word of knowledge in heaven. Because there will be nothing hidden in heaven. There's no words of knowledge to get. There, there, there's no miracles to be done. I, I don't have to have faith to move a mountain. If a mountain needs moved, I suppose I can just do it by the, by the, by the power of the Spirit anyway. I don't need a supernatural power. But the fruit of the Spirit, the change of my life of marinating in the Spirit during this physical lifetime will go with me <clears throat> into the next world and will be what God will base His righteous judgment or what we call the judgment of rewards on of saying the character you have fits you to rule in this realm at this level. Will there be levels in heaven? Absolutely. Clearly, clearly, clearly there will be. You know, will we, all, will we all be equal in a sense that we're all human, that we're all sons of God, that we're all, you know, there by the same process? Yes. In authority, we will not be. Some will have higher positions of authority and reigning in, 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 the, other, in the other realm. And what will this be based on? It's going to be based on our character that we develop in this life. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the reason why Jesus said, in my Father's house there are many mansions? Yes, because <clears throat> there is a place for anybody who wants to go. Anybody who wants to take the journey with Christ, the journey of character, the journey of self-sacrifice, the journey of living this life, walking in the Spirit instead of following the flesh, there's a place for everyone. And anybody, anybody can, go, anybody can go to heaven, anybody can get the highest reward that heaven has to offer, anybody can barely get in by the skin of their teeth. <laughs> so there, 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 is an open, there is an open door to heaven. So it says that we know the whole creation has grown, been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. 
not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Now, if you understand what the first fruits, first fruits are, okay? When, uh, <clears throat> when, they're, when, they're, when they're growing their crops, when the very first little fruit <coughs> comes up, not even really mature, they grab some of it. It's not ready for harvesting, okay? So this is not the harvest. They grab just some of that little, first little bit that comes up, they take it in and they offer it to God as a representation of the entire offering. And that's what the Holy Spirit is in us. It's just a little representation of the great presence of, of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, that we'll have in heaven, because it will, be, it will be all Spirit at that point. For this hope, we were saved. Oh, I'm sorry. We ourselves have the first fruit of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons. The redemption of our bodies. <coughs> and uh, Vince was kind of asking me about this a little bit, little bit earlier. Of, uh, he said, well, is, 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 when we get saved, you know, is, is our carnal man just destroyed at that time or are we going to have to keep struggling with it? And the answer is we keep struggling with it. Yeah. We, are put in human, we are put in fleshly bodies that war against the spirit to train us to war, to harden us to live in the spirit. So we're groaning inwardly because <clears throat> it is not pleasant to be a spirit being living in a physical body. It is never a pleasant process. And just about the time you get older and you lick all the demons, then you got the creaks and cracks, right, Ron? Right? <laughs> so you got the little pains and all that. <clears throat> but we, we, look, we look forward to the time when we get a spiritual body that will match the spirit inside of us. And then we will, uh, and, then, and then all that warfare internally is going to go away, and we're going to be walking in the Spirit. And I wanted to talk about, <clears throat> with that in mind, okay, with that in mind, how do we want to live our lives? Yes, question? I'm sorry, if there's um, several levels in heaven, are there several levels in hell? Yes. Okay. In fact, Jesus, uh, Jesus himself said that... Uh, <clears throat> The, the servant who has uh, less knowledge will be beaten with fewer stripes. The servant with greater knowledge and more accountability will be beaten with greater stripes. Oh, where is that found at? Do you know? Uh, where is that, Ron? Here I am, rolling that out. You know it's there. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's one of Jesus' stories when, when he talks about, you know, accountability of leadership. Okay. Um, and, and he talks about how the, uh, that there are areas where... Uh, some will get fewer stripes, some will get lesser stripes. Um, yeah. Okay. You know, why not? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Makes sense, right? It does. Can I ask a question there? I mean, yeah. I, it's not that I disagree. I, I'm, I'm simply asking a question. Sure. Uh, are, we, are we talking about different levels of reward and, and response rather than different levels of heaven or hell? Well, it, I, what I was talking about was the different levels of authority that, that Christ talks about. Uh, when we get into heavenly realms, and she just asked, is, is, is there different levels of punishment in hell? And there seems to be. There, there seems to be the indication of that. Well, I misunderstood the question. Yeah, she was just asking the other side. Different levels of heaven. If there's different levels of heaven, is there different levels of hell? I don't know if levels would be the word. There, there, there's, there's, only, there's only one heavenly realm, but there will be different levels of authority. Because Jesus talks about some will have authority over one city, some will have authority over five. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, when someone asking about this woman had to uh, had passed away and she had had several husbands and they asked him who's going to be the husband in heaven and then he said in heaven there is no marriage. Right. So we because we will be we will be all angels. But as you said, we will be angels but with different positions. Pretty much. We'll be like angels, yeah. Yeah. And we won't, we won't be angels because angels are a different creation, mm -hmm. but like, pretty much, we yeah. Won't have, we won't have any jealousy then. Mm -hmm. we, we won't have physical bodies. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Which will be a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I mean, talking about levels and things like that, I'm, what about being one in Christ? I mean, when we get up there, we should all have the same mindset. You know, we we, we will. And in fact... Uh, I haven't heard of any different levels in um, Jesus' stories imply that pretty strongly. Uh, Jesus talks about uh, the, the, the marriage feast where uh, someone comes in and sits at a, sits at a lower, lower part of the table, so the master will come and say, move up higher. 
uh, the parent parables of the talents, where one man brings, you know, starts with one talent, brings in ten, so he's given authority over ten cities. One man brings in five talents, he's given authority over five cities. So there, there are a lot of, uh, <clears throat> there, there's one part where we, we, we just really work to get in. <laughs> you know, that's kind of our focus in life. But there's, uh, in, in many of Jesus' stories, there's very much so a, a, there is going to be levels of, when I say reward, reward not in the sense of big piles of gold and silver, but re rewards in the sense of <clears throat> being given authority and responsibility. And we need to understand that, that that's what the Lord is talking about. That's what he considers reward. And we make a mistake when we think of heaven as the place we're going to rest. The actual fact is, I think when we get to heaven, I, I don't know if I want to rest. I, I, I actually kind of like being active. I, it's, uh, somehow rest sounds a little too much like doing nothing. And uh, I know that my body gets tired. Sometimes my mind gets tired. But I wouldn't want to rest forever. You know, I, I, I'd like to take <laughs> off and have some extra time here and there. But I know when my dad retired, it was the worst thing for him. He hated it. Last about three months, he really enjoyed it. And he just started getting very bored. Yeah. The thing is, in heaven, there is no night. So we're not going to be rested. <laughs> so I'll be in that heavenly life. He's talking about night in the, in the Bible, so we're not going to be resting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, and now, <clears throat> what, what, I, what, I want to, what I want to kind of focus in, I'm going to try to segue, and maybe it'll be a discount, discontinuity here. But, uh, something the Lord put on, put on my heart just uh, uh, Monday, and I've been kind of mulling it over to, to talk about it, is um, as we walk in the Spirit, as we move in the Spirit, the important thing is we manifest the fruit of the Spirit, which is not us attempting to produce in us, in ourselves, the outward, the outward appearance of, of the Spirit. You see what I'm saying? It's not that I want to act like I'm at peace. I want to be at peace. It's not that I want to act like I'm loving. I want to be loving. The love yes. needs to come from me. And I do not find myself loving by acting, 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 acting. I find myself loving by being filled with the King of Love. Amen. So if I'm filled with the King of Love and I am choosing the Spirit over the flesh then love will be my presentation to the world. Mm -hmm. Love will be what people see in me because that's what is in me. And as I walk in the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit will come out of me naturally. And as I walk in the Spirit, what I find out is there is a spirit realm that I become more and more in tune with. Like a simple thing, and Mike, Michael can tell you this, if someone will come up to you and ask for prayer, and as you lay hands on them, in the spirit, you'll start thinking, getting this, 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 and this. You get more word of knowledge. What you're doing is you're tuned into the spirit, just like a radio station. You can tune into a certain radio station. So as you tune into the realms of the spirit, you start seeing the thoughts and minds of what's going, or the thoughts of what's going on in the, in the mind of Almighty God. <clears throat> now with that being the case, we need to focus in on what God perceives us uh, as doing in that spirit realm. And it may not be what we see ourselves as doing. See, God sees a need, and we need to think of ourselves as being in an army. Now, when you get inducted into the army, and my daughter's getting ready to go in the Navy, so that's very much on my mind. She wants to be a nuclear technician. She probably will be a nuclear technician, but I can tell you this, when she goes into the Navy, if they decide they need to cook or they need a nuclear tech, guess what she's going to be? Because they're the bosses, aren't they? And it's the same way with God. When God looks at his kingdom and says, you know what I need in this kingdom is this, and you're there and you're saying, Lord, I'll be what you need me to be. <coughs> oh, I need this. Okay. I need a bottle washer. Wait, Lord, I wanted to be a general. I wanted to be a captain. I wanted to be someone in charge of the authority. I wanted to be the guy up here that, that speaks, you know, and everybody listens, Ooh, you know. I wanted this, I wanted that. It's not, my point is, that's not even what's on God's mind. He's not saying no to you 
because he wants to frustrate you or because he doesn't think you're good, you're good enough, he's saying no to you because he needs you over here. Because the needs of his kingdom are, I don't have enough of this. But then, I believe that, you know, it's going to be like a bureaucracy. It's going to be like a bureaucracy. Or like, I, I can imagine now when you're explaining that it's like a, a very tall building with different floors. <laughs> you know? and then, Could be, yeah. yeah. But there is no elevator because once a child gives you a command, you will stay in that position for the rest of your life. Well, it could be. I, I, I've seen people promoted, but you know, like from one thing afraid, to another. You know, because, you know, sometimes, like right now, I am in the middle of a vacation. And I said to myself, you know, <laughs> you know not, I said to myself, not because of my actions, I will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because, you know, like the father thief, that he went to heaven by the grace of God, of Jesus. So then, no matter what we do, like the Bible says, that will, that will not take us to be a kingdom of heaven, so that it's only by the grace of God. But yeah, well, and, and, and I guess what I want to encourage you on is what we need to do is what God says, because that's what he perceives as a need. So for me, for example, I don't know what I really wanted to be in the kingdom of God, although I'd actually tell you what I wanted to be was a doctor. That was my plan my entire childhood growing up, all the way through four years of college. And then finally, at the very end, as I'm accepted to call it, as I'm accepted to med school and getting ready to go, God says, don't go. Which was not easy. <laughs> it was not an easy step to take. God said, that's not where I want you. In my kingdom, that's not what I need. And God called me instead to a life of intercession. But I, <clears throat> I was reading a, a book by Arthur Blessed, who's going to be coming here pretty soon. Well, I'm, looking, I'm totally looking forward to that. <laughs> uh, Arthur Blessed is one of my heroes. And I remember Ar Ar something Arthur said early on in his life before he ever carried a cross, before he ever did anything else, he said, he got down on his knees and he said, Lord, I want to be your utility man. He said, I want to do what you see needs done the most that nobody else is willing to do. He said, when you have some, some job that is so dirty that Billy Graham doesn't want to get his, doesn't want to get his pants, pants dirty, so hard that, that, you know, Earl Roberts doesn't want to do it. He said, you scrape the bottom of the barrel, and you say, come on, bless it, let's do it. And shortly after that, God called him to carry a cross all around the world. That man, honestly, has had more impact than you could possibly imagine in the kingdom of God. I can tell you this, back in 1972, Arthur Blessed carried a 12-foot tall cross all the way from Hollywood, California, all the way to, uh, to New York, and then back to Washington, D.C., <clears throat> planted that cross in Washington, D.C., across from the White House, and fasted and prayed for 40 days solid, because God told him to. And one of the main things he prayed for at that time, he prayed for a, a, three things I remember. He prayed for a wave of revival to sweep across the young people of America. He prayed for... <clears throat> A, uh, the corruption in the White House to be cleaned out, and he prayed for the, uh, for, uh, the election of a, of a president who had openly proclaimed to be born again, using those, using those words. In 1973, a wave of revival swept across the young people of America, because I know because I was part of it. We had no idea where this wave of revival came from. All we know was suddenly, those of us who've been Christians our entire lives found ourselves caught up in something far beyond what we'd ever seen before. A supernatural wave. <clears throat> we started in my church, we had, there were four of us, four young men, <clears throat> and we said, we're gonna follow the Lord whatever. I was a football jock, I took, all my, I took all my football letters off my uniform, and I put on Jesus patches. I found the biggest Bible I could carry, which is, remember the New Living Bible with the, with the puffy top? Biggest one I could find, I got myself a stack of chick tracks and put them on the edge of my desk, and I went to school. And in one semester's time, we saw a third of our high school come to the Lord. We were having giant rallies out in the city square, just packing it out of young people who'd gotten saved in one semester's time. We had no idea what had happened. All we knew is, as we went to other towns, we found that exactly the same thing had happened in town after town after town after town across, across Kansas in exactly the same time period. And it was right after Arthur Blessed finished that fast. And I'll tell you something. <clears throat> Men hold healing crusades, and I do not take away from any of those things.
But Arthur Blessed shook, shook a nation. And that was just America. And he has shaken nation after nation after nation uh, whenever, wherever he's gone and carried his cross. And I'll tell you, and if you see it from his standpoint, you know what he is? He's a dirty, tired man carrying a big, heavy piece of wood. But he is doing what God told him to do. And because God told him to do it, the power of God falls whenever, whenever, whenever he, he walks. So uh, <clears throat> I, I was given this comparison. If you go to uh, 1 Corinthians 9, chapter, uh, verse 24. First Corinthians 9, 24 says, Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. And the King James says, I'm not like a boxer, boxing aimlessly. And I started thinking about that because uh, <clears throat> I remember uh, uh, reading the life of Muhammad Ali. And I'm not going to glorify Muhammad Ali. I just, uh, <clears throat> if, you, if you study boxing and uh, watched it over, over an extended period of time, in the old days they had the gla what they called the gladiator, uh, the gladiator boxing. You'd have two big huge muscle bound men and they get up there and they'd just stand there and they'd pound on each other until one of them was unconscious. And Muhammad Ali pretty much started like that, and he had an incredible punch. And boy, he, he, he'd give, a, remember he gave Sonny Liston that uppercut, knocked him out cold, he did it so fast they had to go back and watch the tape because everybody thought Sonny was just faking it and hitting the canvas. They had to go back and watch the videotapes because he hit him so fast nobody even saw his fist. Incredible uppercut, you know, <clears throat> and uh, just knocked people out cold. Well then, uh, he got in trouble because uh, he refused to go into the military, claiming he was a conscientious objector. And he was stripped of all of his titles and was not allowed to box for four years. And I think actually went to jail for a little while, didn't he? I think he may have gone to jail, maybe. And uh, anyway, he came back, and after four years, he was allowed to resume boxing again. Well, by that time, the power time of his boxing was kind of passed. He didn't have that incredible punch that a young man has anymore. He's still a good boxer, but he didn't have that amazing punch. So he did something never been done before in boxing. He started actually, instead of standing here toe to toe, pounding it out, he started dodging and ducking. He was a very, very fast man. And, and his phrase was, remember, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee? Remember that? Yeah. And he dodged back and forth. And what he found out was, if you throw a punch and you hit something, the very stopping of your punch gives, gives strength to that punch. If you throw a punch and miss, it actually takes more energy to stop that missed swing and to pull that fist back than it does to actually complete the punch. So he would actually start by dodging and ducking, and as the other guys would swing at him and miss, it would actually wear them down. And some of these guys pretty well quit just from exhaustion because he tired them out so much. And uh, now, of course, the way he boxes is uh, pretty well all that you see in the ring nowadays because people have realized there's more power expended when a person misses a punch than there is when they connect. And this is the comparison that Paul gives. And I want to encourage us, <clears throat> as you're walking in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will lead you in things to do. And the things that he will lead you to do will be what needs to be done it's going to be where spiritual things are happening, and you're going to connect with that punch. But if you just kind of run off on your own and say, I'm just going to do something for God, the very fact of missing with that swing not only is going to waste your energy of the swing, but then you've got this whole waste of energy of trying to gather all that back again, don't you? And Ron and I were kind of, last week we were kind of talking about this, and Ron made a comment that I've heard my dad say many times. It, it's much easier to start a ministry than it is to stop one. And it's much easier to give someone authority than it is to take it back later when they're misusing it. Mm. And it's much easier in your life, it's much easier to start something just out of your own mind, but then what are you going to do when God does have something for you to do and you've got to 
collect all this back, you've got to, you know, <clears throat> yeah, you, you, you've got to pull everything back in, and you've already worn yourself out doing things that weren't God. But what God wants us to do is He wants us to walk in the Spirit. Because two things God wants from us, the development of our character, which is what goes on inside of us, and then the moving of the gifts and the power, which is what goes outside of us and flows through us. So there's the building of character in us, there's also the flowing through us. Yes. And God wants both of them moving together, and then he takes us to the places that he wants us to be, that he wants us to minister. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say, so now Ron's going to go his direction. <laughs> I, I, I just like to add a few things. Um, turn your Bible real quickly to Ephesians. We're talking about... Uh, we're talking about two things. Number one, we're talking about the maturity or the development of our character, who we are. Um, there's, there's, and then about what I do. The nature of God, walking in the spirit, is and, and, and having a spirit-controlled life, is and having Christ's nature is who we are. We're children of God. The gifts furnish us with the power to not be, but to do. Um, you're not saved by what you do. See, m most of us, we equate. That's why, uh, we, we, even when we think about heaven, um, we think of it in terms of um, if I do all the right things, I go to heaven. And most of them are eventually determined by what we don't do. That's, that's religiosity. If I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't swear, I don't do this, I don't go there, then that is evident signs of a Christian. And it's not. A ranked sinner can quit smoking. A, a, a vile person may not drink. Someone, someone into a, a, a lifestyle that is that is not acceptable uh, to the Christian walk uh, may not uh, drink or smoke or chew or any of those things. Think about that for a moment. So, so it's salvation is not a minus of things that we don't do. What it develops into is because we take on the nature of Christ, love, kindness, gentleness, meekness, all the nature of Christ, the nature of, the, of God. Then it comes out of us. It, 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 it flows out and, and uh, God adds gifts. And, 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 I, and I'm just talking... Uh, From a, from a concept of the work of God in you through the Holy Spirit to develop your nature, your character. And that's who you are. You know, if you, he made a very strong statement. See, this is where the world gets the word hypocrisy or hypocrite. If you look up the word hypocrite, it means to act. And instead of really being loving and really being kind and really, uh, when put under pressure, it comes out that that's not really what you are. How I many of someone said? Mm -hmm. When someone really provokes you, you're, you're good as long as there's no circumstantial manipulations or persuasions. You're, you, you don't, you're not unkind as long as somebody don't push you. You're not, uh, you're not, uh, you're always good until someone provokes you. But when you really have the nature of Christ provoking, Manipulation, pressure. That's when you really know if that nature of Christ is really in you. If you love somebody when they don't deserve you to love them. When you're kind to someone and, they, and, and, and your flesh is saying no. But your spirit man is saying yes. Love them anyway. Amen? So, so I, I, just, I just want you to. But then the gifts are to assist you and to help you of the work of God, his desire through you. And that is all that he wants to heal people. So he uses you. He wants, he wants to open the heaven's thoughts 
to men. And so he uses all the, you know, the gifts, the thought gifts, the, the verbal gifts, and the, the miracle gifts, uh, whether it be healing, miracles, uh, even, even to the degree of discerning of spirits to where you know what forces you're working against when you come into a room or a setting or a person. Okay? God assists you. Now, turn with me to Ephesians, and I'm just going to share something with you here. And, and um, the Bible said he, he ascended, or verse 10, he that descended or went down the bowels of the earth is the same also that ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things or fulfill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. In other words, he gave, he gave these callings and giftings of being a pastor or an evangelist or a teacher, a perfecting of saints for the work, for the work of the ministry. Now, he gave all of these for the perfecting, and underlying circle that word perfecting, for the perfecting of yeah. Wait, Ephesians. Yeah. Ephesians 4. Sorry. No, sorry, guys. Okay. Ephesians 4. And he gave to the church apostles, and I'll, I'll just simplify, and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. He gave five-fold ministry to the church. Why? For the perfecting of the saints. I want you to look up, I, I want to show you what the word uh, perfecting is. It means to completely furnish or bring to maturity. To completely, it's katarkimus. Uh, it is a, to completely furnish. And, and not just furnish, but completely furnish. The saints. And he, he, gave, he gave me as a pastor to you, you. He gave prophets and teachers and evangelists. And for what? For to fully furnish you for the work of the ministry. He, you know, we, we think that the, that, that the work of the ministry is evangelists, prophets, teachers, pastors. No, he said he gave them to you to develop you for the work of the ministry. And that's why we call this MIT or ministers in training. Uh, we're not talking about pastors in training only. We're not talking about prophets in training only. We're talking about every saint who wants to be developed to do the work of the Lord. Okay? So, so for the perfecting or the maturing or the fully furnishing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying. What, who knows what the word edifying means? Anybody know what it means? Edifying means to, to grow. In other words, to grow, to build up. Yes. Yeah, to build up the person. Yes. And, and that's what it means. It means to build up. What did you say? I'm sorry. To build up. Yes. To, to build an edifice. Yeah. It, it's, it's like a uh, concretely, it's a, it's a typical word concretely or structurally. Build up. He wants to literally build you step by step. A, a prophet may give you a word or a teacher may uh, instruct you in an area. A pastor may inspire or exhort you in an area. I, I'm going to say what I'm saying. And each of them to build something in your life and to fully develop you. And the word there is perfection. Completely furnish you for every situation, every circumstance, and every setting that you may come against. But listen to what it says. Till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a... Somebody read what it says there. Till we all come into what? Perfect. A perfect, perfect man. person, a perfect man. Wait a minute. Man. And we, we all walk in and say, well, we're not perfect. We're not perfect. Yes, you, in, in scriptural terms, you can be. You can be a mature Christian. You can be a fully developed or fully... Now, I'm not talking about without sin perfect. I'm talking about a fully developed, a fully uh, furnished for every situation. Amen? Uh, somebody give me the scripture where it says, Today show thyself approved of God. A word we need not be ashamed. Rightly divide the word of truth. I guess we can go from... Uh, but uh, it says, who's not ashamed uh, uh, of what you do? You know, you can... You can, uh, can you find that scripture for me real quick? 
study to show thyself a perfect. Um, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. That's what I was looking for. We, 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 we can be fully developed and not be ashamed of our, our responses when we're under pressure. Have you ever, have you ever, somebody says something to you and, and when you was done, you go, wow. You didn't need nobody to tell you you didn't act like a Christian. You told yourself. <laughs> Amen. You go, whoa, I blew that. Come on, let's be honest with ourselves. Uh -huh. Have you ever, have you ever, uh, somebody just went off on you and, and you reacted and you go, wow, mm -hmm. Ron, you, you really didn't act like a Christian that time. Mm -hmm. But, but you were developed enough spiritually to know. Amen. All right, now li listen to this. Second Timothy 2.15. Can you read it for me? Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. The worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Yes. Now, it says, and, and we're, we're going to close here in just a, just a second. Uh, Till we all come into the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect person or man. It's not talking about man or woman, but a perfect Christian, a mature, fully developed, fully furnished Christian under the measure, the stature. How do we measure of whether we're fully furnished to the stature of Christ. We act like Him. We, we talk like Christ. Amen? We're not measuring to Ron Fogner. We're measuring to the likeness of Christ. Amen? In healing and in teaching and in power and anointing in all those areas. And I'm trying to close here, but I want you to say that we henceforth, that we from this point be no more children tossed to and fro. That's right. We're not tossed to and fro. We're not manipulated and we're not pushed and shoved around, okay? And carried about with every wind of doctrine. We don't just float from one, one emphasis or principle to another. We're steadfast in the Word. Amen. Amen? Amen. Carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. In other words, people aren't easy. If they don't deceive you quickly and, and cutting craft is by trickery where they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, you speak the truth in love. For they may be lying and deceiving and cheating and ripping you off. Ooh. The, these deceivers. He said, you are no longer children that are caught vulnerable to you know, people's manipulations, people's uh, false teachings, people's persuasions, people's manipulations. You're not caught in that, but you've been so fully furnished. You're not, you're not moved by every wind of doctrine. You're not tossed to and fro. You don't get upset because somebody don't believe exactly like you. Or, or, or have a difference of opinion in certain areas. You don't, you don't fall away and get offended easily. And you don't get tricked easily. But you speak the truth in love. And you grow up unto him in all things. Who? Christ. Which is the head, even Christ. You grow up. Amen. How many, how many both in nature and in gifts want to grow up? Amen. Yeah. Amen. Want to be fully developed. Amen. So you're not easily tricked, easily manipulated but are fully functional and developing in the things of God. Amen. That's what we're talking about tonight. We want you fully developed. And every gift that we can give you will help you. You know, every, uh, every word that we can give you, every instruction will help develop you so you're not easily moved, you're not carried away, you're not deceived, but, you, but you're fully furnished. I, and I'm going to say one more thing, one more minute. I thank God for all the people. They may not have been, they may not have furnished me with, uh, you know, some... Did not first my, my dad didn't furnish me with great theological theory or, or principles. But he furnished me with a great faith by example and, and, and by teaching to believe God for great things, have great tenacity and great integrity. Then I had other people like Paul Crouch, who I worked for for over 10 years, and, and he taught me uh, productivity and he taught me, uh, he taught me integrity in the spirit. He taught me to believe God for great things. He taught me to expect a lot and to give a lot. And, and I, but I was furnished by different people with different things. God has sent me as a pastor to develop certain areas in your life. I, won't be, I can't furnish all of those areas. That's why he gives Brother, Brother West, Brother Mike, uh, other ministers in this church. They will all have an impact and an impartation in yes. your life to fully yes. furnish you. Yes. I, I, I beg for one more minute. Yes. It's like you take Sister Martha. And 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 uh, a brother and sister Ray, or different ones, they're all giving us something in this body that de helps develop us into the fullness 
of Christ till we yes. look, start looking more like Him. Amen. Yes, amen. And it's not just recognized by you, it's recognized those around about you. Amen. amen. I, I love the fact that you're not so easily manipulated, you're not easily amen. offended, and you're able to toss things aside. You say, well, why does that make you so glad? Because that's me. I have learned through the years, just because I don't agree with someone, I'm not going to fall off. I, I, I try hard never to get offended by anything unless it's just absolutely nauseating to God. Amen? Yes. I just don't let little things offend me. I'm just not going to do that. That's one of the great tricks of the enemy. I want to impart that to you. I want you to have great tenacity. I want you to have great faith in God. I want you to believe God for great things. And, and the last thing. I, this, this is me. I'd rather achieve great things in God yes. and fail yes. than to achieve or, or try just little bitty things and, and maybe succeed at almost nothing. I'd rather go for the gusto. I'd rather go for greatness in God. Amen? Amen. I would rather be fully furnished rather than just a one little stool in my, in my house. Amen? Amen. I, I want to furnish you with everything that I can. Amen? I, how, many, how many got this scripture? Amen? Amen. Study it. Amen. That you might be fully furnished. God bless you. Amen. We'll see you on Sunday. Invite somebody. Amen. Last Sunday, you filled the house. Amen? Uh, if there was more here, let's, let's keep working. Yes, Mike? Thank you.